We are so pleased to have Dr. Megan Ding with us today. She is a naturopathic doctor who treats the whole person with natural therapies. And she is a very strong advocate for integrative medicine. Dr. Ding, thank you so much for being with us and you can um, take over the presentation. Thank you, Leslie. Well, welcome everybody to our my presentation tonight on anti-cancer foods. Um, so I'll just get started. So as many of you know, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So as a naturopathic doctor, the majority of my patients I see are dealing with some type of cancer or have gone through cancer treatment in years past, 10 years out or 20 years out. Um, and so a majority of my patients I see currently do have breast cancer or a history of breast cancer. Um, and what I really focus on is helping heal the body through treatment, helping them with nutrition and diet, lifestyle, and then any supplementation in terms of vitamins, minerals, and herbal remedies to help them through treatment and post-treatment as well. So the big tenets for health I always talk about patients is eating well, moving daily, hydrating, sleeping often, and then your relationships, so that mental health aspect of your health. And why is nutrition so important? Because that is the one thing you can empower yourself when it comes to your health, right? You have all these different therapies or, or treatments and, and doctors who help guide you and determine the treatments that you're going through, but what can you do for yourself? And so this is why I really focus on the nutrition aspect for a lot of my patients. So we'll get started. The first big one is leafy greens. So leafy greens are things like arugula, kale, you can see on the PowerPoint, all these different types of vegetables that are great as being lightly steamed or raw. And you really get the benefits of these because these are natural detoxifiers in the body. So they help really your liver to detox any toxins and then eliminate it through your bowels. And the great part of these are the um, detoxification that they do on a cellular level. So they not only provide fiber, folate, um, corella, carotenoids, and different vitamins and iron and calcium, but these are the different uh, chemicals that help with the liver process and detox. The next one is lycopene. So lycopene you're gonna find in a lot of your red vegetables, mainly the tomatoes. It is a high antioxidant. Um, best is always cooked, actually. So the best thing you can do is make a pasta marinara sauce out of tomatoes, and that's where you're gonna get the most benefits from the lycopene. It, the process of cooking the tomatoes actually brings out more lycopene in the vegetables. So contrast into like raw vegetables of the leafy greens, this is one that you, you really benefit from cooking it. The next one is seaweed. So not a lot of people eat seaweed. Then you may eat it like a sushi wise. Um, there's seaweed salad sometimes. My preference is having actually the seaweed strips um, like chips wise or the roasted um, strips that you can find as like little snack packs that are just lightly salted. And the reason is the biggest one is the selenium that they provide. The selenium is a big antioxidant um, it has fucoidin, which provokes apoptosis, which is the natural cell death. So this is the proper cell death that all cells go through. And, but cancer cells just like to kind of don't have that signal. And so they just continue to replicate and, and grow. But we want them to die naturally. Um, and then it also stimulates immune cells, especially natural killer cells. It also has some carotenoids and is anti-estrogenic. So especially for breast cancer patients who are um, ER positive. The next one is berries. So we're gonna talk a little bit about fruit. 
Um, so a lot of people know about berries and how much antioxidants they have. The antioxidants in berries are called procyanidin antioxidant. So POCs is the short form. So they have quite a bit of vitamin C, vitamin A, gallic acid, and then all kinds of, um, again, lycopene or different antioxidants as well. So these can be any berries, whether it's strawberries, raspberries, um, goji berries, blackberries, blueberries, all are really helpful um, in creating antioxidant stimulation in the body. The other types of fruit that are really beneficial are any brightly orange colored fruit or vegetables. The so citrus fruit, squash, sweet potatoes, um, all have carotenoids. So, um, even like carrots as well. So these are a lot of the antioxidants you will find, most often linked to eye health, but the antioxidants that they provide are gonna be still beneficial for your overall immune health. So a lot of people come to me and saying, well, I can't, I'm trying to limit the sugar because cancer is fed with sugar and it grows and, and grows. But when you look at the different types of sugar you're eating, I tell my patients to not avoid sugar. So when we look at this little uh, table, we have a donut, it's 200 calories, but it's 10 grams of sugar, but zero grams of fiber and zero phytonutrients. Compare that to an orange, which has less calories, yes, a little bit more sugar, yes, but you get fiber and 170 phytonutrients. So this, these benefits definitely outweigh the um, negativities about eating fruit. I usually say if you're afraid of the sugar levels, especially if you're a diabetic and watching your sugar levels and glucose, then the best way to eat it is as a whole fruit where you get all that fiber or in a smoothie, not as a juice um, because you take away all that fiber and fiber helps you actually absorb all your phytonutrients. Next one is one of my favorites um, is our mushrooms. So this can be anything from white button mushrooms that you oftentimes see in the grocery store all the way to a little bit more exotic that can be like shiitake mushrooms or enoki mushrooms, things that you can cook with at home. So they're great immune modulators. And the reason why they're modulators is that they don't actually stimulate the immune system, but they help with increasing immune receptors, especially within the cell. So your immune system is more aware about, oh, what is coming in and your cells are more aware rather than just given an immune boost when we talk about like vitamin C or um, other type of natural things like echinacea or elderberry, which are two big um, herbs in the natural world when it comes to the immune system. So this is why mushrooms can be really great, especially being used during uh, chemotherapy and radiation. Um, there's so much studies out there, especially coming from Japan, that they actually give all their patients who are going through chemotherapy some type of mushrooms, whether it's food-wise or supplement-wise, they're always going to get some type of mushroom um, to help improve their immune function through their treatment. And the next one is cruciferous vegetables. So cruciferous vegetables are essentially, um, the biggest one is gonna be broccoli, but anything that is in that almost cabbage-like head family. So cauliflower, cabbage, kale, bok choy, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, mustard greens, rutabaga, turnip greens. So they provide quite a bit of zinc, magnesium, and a lot of your vitamins. But the particular reason why these are so special compared to other uh, vegetables is because they contain a component called indole 3 carbonyl I3C, or 
um, which turns into DIM in the body. And so these components actually help aid in estrogen metabolism. So it actually helps your liver detox properly the estrogen that's circulating through your body. Um, so that's why it's so important for breast cancer patients, particularly those who are estrogen positive. And I have a little graph. So this is a typical um, hormone test that I do with a lot of my patients. It's called the Dutch urine test. Um, and what we test for is a lot of their estrogen levels. But what it's looking at is how you're metabolizing your estrogen. So there's two phases that your estrogen go through. First phase is, occurs in the liver, and it's getting broken down into three different types, 16-OH, 4-OH, and 2-OH. And then it moves into the gut um, for phase two, which helps um, essentially you eliminate it through your stool. The reason why we look at this is no matter how much estrogen you have, even if you are um, medically Induce hysterectomy or your postmenopausal, there's always going to be some estrogen circulating it from the tissues that you still have. Um, and so, how are you metabolizing that little bit of estrogen that you have is really important. The 2OH is the most protective type of estrogen. So, this is where we want to see the most estrogen being metabolized. And we can see that the expected percentages are 60 to 80 percent. And I've seen patients more, and that's okay. Um, and then we also have 4OH and 16OH. These are the two that are very less protective. They actually increase DNA damage or your risk for certain types of hormonal imbalances, such as the um, endometriosis, fibroids, and then also breast cancer, ovarian cancer, those types of hormonal issues um, or hormonal driven diseases. And so then we have to see like, are you, even if you have more of 4-OH, are you able to detoxify even properly, even more? And then 16-OH, we want even less of that. So in terms of the liver, we're talking about the broccoli and the cruciferous vegetables. Um, let me just kind of scale back, is that the broccoli, to get the high amount of the dim that we want from the broccoli, the studies actually show that we um, patients will need almost three pounds of broccoli a day. That is a lot eat. So the times I'll kind of supplement that in a supplement wise to help patients. So that's kind of the phase one, the liver detoxification of the estrogen. Then we talk about phase two, which flax seeds are really helpful for. So they are going to help kind of bind up the estrogen, any circulating type of hormone still, and then you eliminate that through your food. And so they have, are rich in omega-3s, high in lignans, which are antioxidants and phytoestrogens. They are anti-inflammatory. And again, the fiber can help with detoxification. So for years, we were always taught that we need to eat low fat. Um, and when we started as a, as nations kind of introducing that low fat guidelines around the late 80s, we can kind of see how our obesity trends started rising really high. And this is because food wise, in order to make things tasty, companies started replacing fat with sugar. And so we can't be afraid of fat because it actually helps us um, because we, know that obesity trends actually increase your risk for cancer. These are the fat benefits. And I'm talking about good fats and we'll kind of discuss that. But the reason why um, fat is so important is that it actually helps you utilize the protein, decreases inflammation, helps with that fullness um, 
mechanism so that you're not always hungry. Um, helps with lowering cholesterol, is heart healthy, helps with your hair and nails and brain health. Um, and the most important thing is that it actually helps you absorb a lot of your vitamins. So vitamins A, D, E, and K all need some type of fat to actually be absorbed into the body. So if you're eating all these great foods, but you're not having some sort of good fat to go with it, then you're most likely not getting the most benefit from the food that you're eating. So these are my top ones for omega-3s. Olive oil, avocado, avocado oils, nuts, seeds, cold water fish like salmon, herring, um, anchovies, sardines, cod, those are gonna be all your good cold water fish. Now, I kind of skipped over the coconut oil. I th it is still really beneficial for the omega-3s, but I do caution about using coconut oil on a daily basis. Um, I always prefer that patients just only use coconut oil when they're baking rather than cooking with it because I've seen cholesterol levels actually increase from it um, just because a lot of people are unable to fully process it. So if you do need to use an oil substitute, then coconut oil is good for baking. Yeah. And so if you're looking for like a good substitute for high heat um, oil is actually avocado. So wild caught fish. So these are gonna be the great sources of omega-3s. Salmon, mackerel, sardines, cod, herring, um, and anchovies as well. So they are anti-inflammatory, so they help prevent cancer. They are a natural enhancement of anti-tumor therapies, reduce symptoms of treatments like chemotherapy, especially with um, losing weight. It helps with appetite stimulation and then absorption of vitamins and minerals. And then it also helps you preserve your muscle mass and function during chemotherapy. And then it also helps to reduce inflammatory response resulting from any toxicity that you get from the treatment. So earlier we talked about the liver and how important it is for detoxification. Then we go to the gut. So it moves from the liver to the gut. Um, and here we're talking about probiotics. So why are probiotics really important? Because 80% of your immune system starts in the gut. Um, so we want good bacteria to actually break down our food properly, help with the processing and absorption of our food, and help with the detoxification and the elimination of any toxins and hormones. Okay. So great sources of probiotics, of course, is yogurt. So I always prefer my patients, especially because of um, how inflammatory dairy is, that I ask them to um, use more of like a sheep's, goat, a sheep's or goat's milk yogurt. Um, it has just as much uh, good bacteria and probiotics but doesn't have the inflammatory uh, stages that dairy or cow's milk. Other sources is more of a kefir source, and then sauerkraut, pickles, so anything that's really fermented, kombucha is a drink, kvass, tempeh. So I have a lot of questions from a lot of my patients who ask about soy. I rather have patients um, use soy as a fermented source like tempeh rather than eating it as like a tofu or edamame or even like soy protein. Just because what I've seen, especially if you haven't been eating some type of soy like tofu since young, it definitely um, creates inflammation in the body or, or promotes estrogen more than in Asian countries where you see that it's introduced much earlier on to the diet of, of young children. And then the last one is miso. So. 
The other component of your digestion is digestive enzymes. So these are the enzymes that come into your stomach, to your um, intestines, and help break down your food. Okay. So natural digestive enzymes you can find is pineapples, papayas, mangoes, and apple cider vinegar. These are going to help you process your food better. So especially if you have any reflux or heartburn issues that are quite frequent, you may want to look into adding these to your diet more, especially just a little bit before eating a meal. Um, because what I oftentimes see is that we don't have enough of these digestive digestive naturally in our body. And especially as we age, we naturally um, decrease our production of it. So that's why you see a lot more reflux and heartburn issues in the elderly population. So what happens is you eat food, and if you don't have enough digestive enzymes, it's just kind of sitting there in the stomach, and then the stomach acid comes in, and that's creating a, an environment for the acid reflux to come up with that food just sitting there. Versus if you introduce it a little bit before your meal, then it's already there to help break down the food and move it along. Next thing is green tea. So the great part about green tea is not that it's anti-inflammatory, so antioxidant, but it is a VEGF inhibitor. So cancer tumor cells pull this signal out in the body, and it's called the VEGF. And what it does, it helps kind of signal to the body that they need blood supply. And so that blood supply starts coming in and it actually feeds the cancer tumor cells. What green tea does is helps kind of block that signal so that it reduces the progression of um, a lot of the cancer cells. So it helps in reduce that process that cancer cells like to do and grow. So that's really why green tea is really important. So I usually recommend to my patients drinking at least five cups a day. If you're very sensitive to caffeine, try drinking that in the morning or get in decaf. Um, you still get the benefits of green tea even if it is decaffeinated. One is herbs and spices. This group are gonna be your natural um, herbs that you usually find in your kitchen cabinet. So mint, thyme, marjoram, oregano, basil, rosemary, all really help because they have terpenes. So that's the chemical um, that they have. And it helps with natural cell death. So apoptosis. The carnosol and rosemary is antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Um, so you can kind of see how it, it helps with the anti-inflammatory processes. Um, I also really like it as a general immune system um, helper because it is also a lot of these are antimicrobial as well. So if you're having like a touch of a cold, these are really great to start eating more. And then cinnamon. So cinnamon is a great uh, blood sugar regulator. Um, so a lot of people who have blood sugar irregularities, you can dash a little bit of cinnamon, whether it's like in your coffee or over fruit or on a piece of toast to kind of help stabilize your blood sugars. But it also acts like um, berries because it has that same component in berries, uh -huh. but the proanthocyanidins. And so it's um, also anti-inflammatory for the body. The next two are parsley and celery. So these are great types of herbs that actually detox the cells on the cellular level. They actually pull a lot of heavy metals from the body, especially like mercury um, that you may 
have a little, but it's not going to cause any um, pronounced symptoms or cause a huge detoxification. It's just a slow detoxification. And so it actually helps with um, inducing cell death, inhibits cell proliferation, blocks angiogenesis, which is also the um, blood supply that we were talking about earlier. It reduces cancer growth and gene expression, and it's really helpful for patients who are uh, progression positive as cancer. So these are two really good cellular detoxers. Then we have turmeric. So um, turmeric is the actual plant that you can find at some of the grocery stores. The actual component that's really important of turmeric is called curcumin. So th those are kind of interchangeable for a lot of people. Turmeric is really helpful in reducing inflammation and helping with regular cell death, the apoptosis. Um, but it does need a few components to actually be absorbed. Um, so it can be either a little bit of black pepper or some type of heavy fat. So there is a recipe called golden milk, which a lot of people like to do um, or use at night to help with anti-inflammation. So using some type of heavy fat, whether it's like a coconut milk or um, some type of like sheep or goat's milk, something like that, and you heat it up, add in some turmeric, a little bit of black pepper, and then you can add a little bit of honey if you want to for taste, and then drinking that at night to help um, increase your turmeric intake. So if you cook with it, that's why um, you need some type of heavy fat to absorb it well. Uh, that's why curry is a great, um, great dish to kind of make with turmeric get the most benefit. And then the next one is garlic. So garlic is an immune booster. It is antioxidant. It is anti-angiogenic, anti-proliferative. It helps with um, protecting the body during chemo. It helps with detoxification. And the two important um, components of garlic are allicin and quercetin. So both are going to be anti-inflammatory and help with your immune system. So you can eat garlic as raw, you can cook with it, you can eat, use it as a seasoning, all are going to be really protective for the body. Ginger. So it's, ginger is really great in helping to um, help with the inflammation that's caused by cancer. Um, it's oftentimes used during uh, chemotherapy to help reduce nausea. So a lot of patients will use ginger teas during chemotherapy if they're having nausea, or they will even uh, suck on some of the ginger lozenges. So it just helps diminish the nausea sensation that it has. Then we get to kind of... Um, so those are kind of the anti-cancer foods that I wanted to talk about. Really, it's about filling your diet with good food. You know, we all can't be perfect all the time, but it's also creating kind of a habit as well. And so it, the more that you introduce more good foods to your diet, it kind of weeds out the bad, right? You're, you're eating well, and then you're not craving um, a lot of like the desserts or candies or or fried foods as much as um, you may have been. So this is typically what I ask my patients to have a plate of. So you wanna look at having half your plate each day and at each meal of non-starchy vegetables. So that can be salad, leafy greens, broccoli, cabbage, green beans, all kinds of things, mushrooms even. So those are gonna be your non-starchy vegetables. And then about a quarter or a third of your plate is going to be some type of protein. It can be either if it's an animal protein or um, you're a pescatarian or if you're a vegetarian or vegan, then you're looking at like nuts, seeds, eggs, beans, and all that. 
And then you always want to have a little bit of a drizzle of healthy fats. So olive oil is best as raw. So you can drizzle some of that on your food. Um, avocados, nuts, grass-fed butter, if you want to use that, coconut oil or avocado oil to cook with are great. And then some starchy vegetables. Get more of that starch if you need that. So sweet potatoes, pumpkin, beets, carrots, potatoes, things like that too, if you need like a more bulkier type of And then the type of foods. So when we talk about fruits and vegetables and our meats and fish, we always want to talk about how we're sourcing our food. And so every year the Environmental Working Group has a um, two different lists that they come out with. So there's the Dirty Dozen list and then the Clean 15. So Dirty Dozen are the fruit and vegetables that hold the most pesticides. And then Clean 15 are going to have the least amount of pesticide residues. So these are ones that you can be, if, especially if you're working on a budget, ones that you can be a little bit more lenient on, on not buying organic. And then if you're kind of paying attention more, you really want to get these as organic um, fruit and vegetables. Strawberries and spinach and kale are always going to be the top. Never seen them moved for the past five years or so. So these are going to be the ones that you definitely want to eat organically. You can find this on the EWG's website. So a few things to deal with when we're talking about just food-wise and, and reducing our pesticide intake. So you want to just essentially soak your vegetables first. And that way it actually, the water, you just need cold distilled water and it actually pulls a lot of any pesticides out of the fruit. So you can kind of see a little bit of that picture behind all the words, um, of your berries being soaked. If you're having produce that are a little bit thicker skin, then you wanna just use a gentle vegetable brush, but it's not necessary to use any special soap or detergent. The, the most benefit is getting at least uh, three minutes of soaking time. That's kind of how we source our food and then we're moving to how we eat. So I, I do get a lot of questions about intermittent fasting these days. So I always include it when I talk about anti-cancer foods because it's a way to help um, with cancer reduction. So this is a typical intermittent fasting um, that a lot of people do where you use 16 hours of fasted and eight hours of fed. So these 16 hours are usually taking place when overnight, not during the day. And then you find eight hours window of your food to fit in two, three meals. But this is the reason why intermittent fasting is really important. So it helps lo lower levels of insulin and improves your insulin sensitivity. Um, it increases levels of norepinephrine which helps your body break down fat to be used as fuel and benefits your metabolism. So you can kind of see all the metabolic adaptations that take place during a fasting state. Um, and so essentially it's helping reset your immune system. It when you follow that circadian rhythm of overnight fasting, that's when your body's kind of resetting and regenerating the immune system. So why not give your body a little bit more of a rest without having to focus on digesting food rather than, and so you focus more on your immune system when you're sleeping. So there was a study that showed that intermittent fasting during chemotherapy. So these are the red ones are all markers for patients who had chemotherapy and did not do fasting. And when fasting was introduced, we can see their severity markers greatly reduced for a lot of their um, 
symptom during chemotherapy that arise. And you don't have to do a full 16 hours. A lot of the studies show that at least 13 to 14 hours nightly will show the most benefit. There was one um, study showing in the JAMA Oncology that prolonged nightly fasting helped um, with the breast cancer prognosis. And so they saw half of the women fasted for more than 12.5 hours per night and half fasted for less than 12.5 hours per night Fasting for fewer than 13 hours per night was associated with a 36% higher risk. Fasting for 13 hours at least really helps reduce your And So why is it really important? It helps with the gut bacteria because your gut has its own circadian rhythm. And so when you fast, it drives the good probiotics um, to help with insulin resistance, helping with decreased inflammation. It is a lifestyle change. So I usually tell patients, okay, start with one night per day, um, per week, then increase it to two, then three, slowly work your way up to the full seven days per week. Um, and so we can usually get to five days to a full week for a lot of people. Um, it just depends on lifestyle and, and what they have going on, especially when they're being a little bit more social on the weekend. That is the end of my presentation. So thank you all for listening. I think we have a few questions that people had, Leslie? Yes, we okay. do have some questions. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, let me bring them up here. Okay, um, so Lindsay Corbett would like to know, does the seasonal availability and source of the vegetables, berries, and fruit have an impact on their nutritional value? No, they don't. So seasonal is great in terms of just what is available and support in our local grocers and, and farmers. Um, and you always want to make sure that the sourcing is, is natural. So if we are getting unseasonal fruit, so say tropical fruit during the summer, uh, winter months, you just want to rethink, okay, where is it coming from? Are they using good practices? And that's where um, the sourcing does matter at that point when it comes. Okay. Um, Kiva Skinner would like to know, are mushrooms better cooked or is it just as good to eat them raw? Yeah, so you can eat it either way. Um, so raw is great. Cooked, you're going to get a little bit more extraction of the benefits um, from mushrooms. So you can cook them even down to like soups um, as long as like hot. So that's going to be really beneficial. You'll still get a, a good amount of benefit from eating raw, but the most benefit is going to be in a cooked fruit. Okay. She has several other questions. Um, mm -hmm. what, what is the recommended serving size of fruits and vegetables daily? Five to six um, serving sizes. This is quite a bit. Um, okay. But... Um, a serving size can be like um, like half an apple. It's not very much of an actual serving size. So when you kind of add it up, it's going to be two to three apples a day or two to three cups of berries per day. Okay. And she would like to know if you are accepting new patients, would she need a referral and do you accept insurance coverage? Oh, okay. So I do see patients. Um, I work out of Charlotte Natural Wellness, which is a clinic. Um, I see them virtually and in person. So it just depends on um, your scheduling availability and, and how soon we can get you in. But I do accept new patients. Um, I do not accept any health insurance. Naturopathic medicine is not covered by health insurance. We do accept HSA and FSA funds if you want to use those. Um, but it would be out of Okay. Um, and she wants to know how much flax seed daily. Okay, 
So um, at least one tablespoon, tablespoon per day, better it would be two tablespoons, and that's um, ground flax seeds are better. You can eat it either way, add it to a smoothie, put it in some soup, or sprinkle it onto your salad, or mix it into your oatmeal. Okay, let me get to the next question here. Uh, Lindsay Corbett is asking, what's the major concern with using the conventional cooking oils like canola, vegetable, and safflower oils or shortening? Okay, so the issue is that it has a lot of omega-6s. What omega-6s do is that they counteract the benefits of omega-3s. And so when we look at um, our different cholesterol um, components, we want to have a higher amount of omega-3s. Um, so omega-6s actually create inflammation, and then omega-3 decrease inflammation. So we want more omega-3s. And the easiest way to benefit from that is getting, changing out the oil. OK, that makes good sense. Um, Laura Miller would like to know how much apple cider vinegar before meals for an anti-reflux property, would a teaspoon work? Yes, a teaspoon would work. You can drink it um, straight if you can handle it, or you can dilute it with a little bit of water. I find that that's much easier. And then about 10 to 15 minutes before your meal is going to be most better. Could you do that at bedtime too, um, if you have reflux when you lie down? You could, yeah. You just want to be cautious that it's not going to create more acid reflux because if it's not digesting anything, then it's just going to sit there as well. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and Kiva Skinner would like to know, uh, can she use any brand of green tea? Yeah. So definitely like an organic type of brand is, is going to be um, what you want to look at just because um, green tea is so available and farmed. So much nowadays that you just want to be cautious about um, just what they spray and so you want to look for organic but most tea brands are going to be really beneficial when they're organic. Okay and Tiffany would like to know are flavored green teas okay? Yes so that's a great one like a lot of people don't like um, green tea flavor and so you can have like oftentimes it's mixed with like hibiscus tea or raspberry, so those are good natural sweeteners. Um, I'll even have my patients make like a pitcher and throw in a bunch of fruit like in there to just kind of diffuse and, and give it some, a little bit more taste to it if you like. Or you can use um, matcha tea as well if you like. Um, a little bit less bitter, but you can make it into more of like a latte if you want. Okay. And Kiva would like to know if dried herbs work just as well as fresh herbs. They do, yes. Yeah, so there's no difference. Okay. Um, Dana McSwain says that she is currently taking turmeric capsules as well as Japanese mushrooms and several other supplements. Do supplements work as well as eating the foods, for example, garlic and cinnamon? So it depends on what you're trying to target. So if you're in treatment, I would say you would have to be careful when it comes to taking capsules, um, supplements. So that's why we just promote it at least through your nutrition. But then if you feel like you need additional support, that's where supplements are. So that's the reason why supplements are named supplements, to supplement your lifestyle, to supplement your nutrition that you're already doing. Um, but they are great um, as capsule forms because they give you a lot higher dosing. You're going to get a lot more than what the typical person is going to just be able to eat during the day. If they're really focused, they may be able to get all of that, those benefits in their meals, but sometimes it's really hard with our lifestyles. So that's where kind of supplements play a, a good role in it. Um, and, and they're already manufactured or processed to have those good components to help with it. So that's why vitamin D is often found like in a little soft gel or like as a dropper form because it has the oil to help absorb it better into the body. So there's good benefits to actually taking. Okay. 
Um, and Kiva wants to know if distilled water, uh, when you soak your berries, do you use distilled water or is tap water better? Distilled water would be best, but you can still use tap water. The reason why distilled is because you are um, taking a lot of the chemicals that are in tap water. So, um, unfortunately, our, our water, even though it's purported to be clean, we know that there's still going to be some type of chemicals in there. And uh -huh. so, using distilled water is going to Would be better. Okay. And... Um, for the 16 hour or the 13 or 14 hour fast, mm -hmm. does that not include water? No, it doesn't. Um, so maybe I need to clarify. So you can drink water throughout your fast. Um, liquids like vegetable broth are even fine as well. Um, but, and coffee is fine as well, unless you're adding things to your coffee. When it okay. Can. Yeah, so if you're doing like adding a creamer or, or milk or sugar or something like that, then that definitely takes you out of a fasting state. Right. Okay. Um, is it better to use regular sugar or stevia? Stevia is better. Um, I prefer, I don't like either one. So I of course like sugar. Um, stevia to me has like a chemical taste when I, it's not cooked. So I usually don't use stevia, but some people, a lot of people like stevia. So that's a great choice. Okay. Um, and Tiffany is asking the type of water to drink, alkaline or spring water? Either one is fine. Um, when you think about it, you just want to have some type of clean source water. So I prefer patients to just get like a filter or like a filter on their sink or something like a Brita filter is even great enough when you think about like all the alkaline and spring water, where are you getting it usually from? Are you getting it in bottles that you're buying? So then all that plastic you're drinking out of, it's not so great. So then that kind of outweighs the benefits that you get from the spring and alkaline water, unless you have like a fancy system at home for those. So if you're kind of looking at water, Best is just to get like a good filter app. Okay, that's all the questions that we have in the chat. Um, I would like to just uh, let everyone know that if you have a question that you would like to unmute yourself and ask Dr. Ding now um, before the presentation is over, please feel free to go ahead and do that. I don't want you to miss an opportunity to ask her a question. Hi, I have a quick question. This is Dana. Um, off of the last question about sugar and stevia, um, I have heard a lot about um, sugar um, increasing cancer and increasing the growth of the can the tumor. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? So, so what sugar does is it does increase the progression of cancer and not as a direct way that a lot of people or it's, it's kind of advertised as. So what it does, it help, it does increase your insulin. Um, it does decrease your insulin sensitivity. Um, and so because of that, it, it uh, kind of starts a cascade of different um, avenues or, or signals to the cancer, so it leads to more inflammation that's created in the in, entire body. So yes, it has a very indirect, but we know that there are direct correlations with higher um, risks of cancer when it comes to diabetes, obesity, and things like that that are related very much to sugar intake. So yes, there is a correlation, but it's not like as direct as most people say. So that's why I still have patients have natural sugar. So that's why stevia is still great because it doesn't increase your blood glucose like white sugar does. And then that's why fruit is still great. You still get all the phytonutrients and fiber and other benefits from actual fruit rather um, than like a dessert or candy.
Anybody else would like to ask a question? Yes, this is Tiffany. I have a quick question for Dr. Ding. And it's a little bit about, you know, with the alkaline and acidic. I've always heard that, you know, if your body is acidic, it kind of is cancer, mm -hmm. I guess, feeding. So I guess, can you, can you talk a little bit about making sure that your body is more alkaline based and the different things you should do or the types of food? I mean, all the foods that you listed, are they all like alkaline based types of food? Yeah, so when you're talking about um, an alkaline diet, when you actually look at it as a whole, it's going to be very close to a Mediterranean diet or an anti-inflammatory diet. Essentially, being alkaline means that you're decreasing the inflammation that's going on in the body. So I don't always focus on the actual alkaline diet, but more so increasing like the vegetables that help decrease inflammation. Um, and creates less of an acidic situation. You can, you'll see it on your blood work. You can look at the like um, carbon dioxide in your blood. That's usually tested and you can kind of see whether or not you're, you're increasing acidity um, through your food. But essentially, if you're eating a, a pretty well-rounded healthy diet, you're gonna be in an alkaline state naturally. So. I usually don't have patients worry too much about acidity. Who else has a question? Um, I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about um, I heard recently something about certain compounds or something uh, being created when meat is cooked at a very high temperature. Um, I wanted to ask about that. Does that have a, like, the method of cooking for the meat have an impact on its healthiness? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially what it's getting at is that, like, when you cook high temperatures, the, the meat, um, you can physically see it where you get, like, that char. Um, and so that char is not going to be beneficial at all. Um, so th that's kind of the physical sign that you see, okay, it's getting too hot. Um, and you, so that process of cooking high heat for meat can be kind of dangerous because you think of like, you're essentially eating that carbon. Um, and so that pulls all your nutrients. It's like, it's charcoal essentially. So when we ingest charcoal um, or similar to charcoal, then it just absorbs everything good or bad in the body. And so then you're not getting benefits of all the other food that you're eating along with that meat. Mm. Interesting. So if we grill out, um, what, what do you recommend as far as grilling meat on a grill? So I think, you know, grilling is, is great. You just want to make sure that you're not um, cooking it so much that you're getting like this whole layer of, of grilling that's going on. A little bit grill is, is okay, but okay. the balance and are you eating it every day or every week? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, once in a while is, is, is okay. Okay. Good question. Sometimes it's just all about trying to like create balance in, in your diet. You, know? you, you want to kind of increase the good food um, and create that as a habit for you, as a routine, but mm -hmm. not feeling guilty if you have like a social event or, you know, celebrating good things or want to do something nice and that, yeah. Okay. Anyone else have a question for Dr. Ding? All right. Well, this has been an amazing... I, I, uh -huh. I have a quick. I do have a quick question. Is it possible to um, get a copy of the presentation or no? Um, it will be on our YouTube channel. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Yes, the Carolina Breast Friends YouTube channel. You'll be able to watch it again at your leisure. Okay. And um and and so the entire presentation will be. It'll probably be a week or so before it's on there. Okay. Okay. Hey. All right. Anybody else? I saw 
Um, somebody put in the chat about alcohol and beer. Okay, good. I need to look at the chat. Uh, we do have a few more questions that I missed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's just see where we were. Uh, one second. Is BPA free plastic okay for water? Um, yeah, it's okay. But you also don't want to like go out and replace everything as well. Like that's not great for the environment. So you want to get stick to whatever is plastic BPA free at home. And then if you want to switch mm -hmm. to glass or stainless steel, that's great as well. Okay. And the next question is, ideally, how many servings of green leafy vegetables per day? Um, I don't have like a particular serving, really. So I'm just looking at um, kind of that five to six amount of servings for your vegetables per day. And then I usually just say, cut your plate in half or your bowl in half, and it should be filled with vegetables. Okay, and then um, one of our survivors is asking about alcohol and beer. Okay. Is that in moderation, I'm sure? Yes, in low moderation, preferably. I mean, when you're looking at it, alcohol and beer are essentially just sugar-filled drinks, right? You're drinking a lot of sugary liquid at one point. You do get the benefits from good red wine, um, the drier, the better, so that the sugar um, content is even lower when it becomes drier. Um, so that's great, but you do want to just kind of keep it in moderation. I would prefer patients to do red wine over beer because beer is phytoestrogenic. So you kind of see that physically when you're because of the hops in beer. So when you physically see like a man who is a beer drinker and they have a little pot belly, that's where the estrogen sits for a lot of us, or they get um, kind of the hand chest um, <laughs> when they drink a lot of beer. That's the beer um, pushing the estrogen in the body. So you can kind of think about how that would affect women as well. Interesting. Okay, well, let's. Should you um, not have wine or? alcohol while you're going through chemo? Yeah, if you can, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking to see if there's anything else that I missed. Okay, I think that's it. Anybody want to have the last question? Me, I? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped in. I win. <laughs> um, so if you're preparing to have surgery, a mastectomy, how do you eat like the weeks before that? Or how can you be best prepared? Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of want to move towards um, kind of the foods we already talked about. Um, but you also want to increase actually your omega-3s in food. Now they'll say stop any fish oil or um, omega-3 type of supplement before your surgery, especially about two weeks out before your surgery because it can increase um, blood thinning. Um, but food-wise, it's not gonna do that same effect as a supplement. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so the reason why um, we want the omega-3s, it actually helps with um, better wound healing um, with that protein structure. Um, and then it just helps with, especially appetite as well, um, when you have low appetite after when you're on a bunch of medication. And can you mention one more time, omega-3? I know yeah. fish, right? So yep. fish, so fish like salmon, salmon. herring, yeah. cod, um, anchovies, and sardines are going to be your big five. Um, and then nuts, seeds, um, avocados, oh, yeah. olive oil. <laughs> good okay okay one last chance I don't want to I don't want to end it if somebody has a burning question I have a burning question <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> intermittent fasting um, listen to my frame, um, time frame Dr. Ding if I start my intermittent fasting at 11 
and in that seven. Is that a good time frame? Am I over? Am I under? So, so you're eating from eleven o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock to seven at night. I stop okay. at seven. Yeah, that's a good eating. Um, that's about like an eight hour. Eating okay. Cycle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As long as we can have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so black you can have coffee. your black coffee as fine, <laughs> right. just as long as you don't add to it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ding, I was going to ask, um, if you do the intermittent fasting, does it matter what you eat, like, at the beginning? Like, because, you know, That's a good question. so many people say it needs to be a protein or that it, should, that it shouldn't be a carb. Right. <laughs> so, so you do want to kind of have it as like a full meal that has all those components. You can have your carb, but it needs to have a protein, it needs to have a fat, and it needs to have your vegetables, right? So, so it, it should have like a pretty well-rounded um, component if you're gonna have some type of like refined or not refined, but some kind of carbohydrate in there, or grain in there, so that you're processing it um, easily with all the other components in your meat. And how often did you say um, to do the intermittent fasting? So if you can work your way up, um, because we don't, um, it can take time to work your way up. Like, you know, I usually start with one day a week and try to work your way up to all seven days a week because you'll have cravings. You'll have kind of sometimes mood swings or things like that. So you just want to kind of be cautious with that. And, and make sure you can handle that. If you stop at two times a week, that's fine. You know, you're still giving your body some type of break um, on a weekly basis. And you said how many hours? At least 13. Okay. Yeah, 13. So most people are doing like 10 to 12, if you look at it. But if, you know, work schedules, eating habits, activities, school kids, whatever the case is, that can really like, it's shorten your, your fasting period when you're sleeping. Um, sleeping. So you want to kind of extend it to that 13 hour. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, last chance. <laughs> well, this has been wonderful. Dr. Ding, thank you so much. We learned so many new things and things that will help us. Good, good. Well, I'm glad to see like new faces. It's been a little bit of a while since I've been back. So well, we will you. love to have you again in the future. <laughs> okay. So you stay well and thank you so much for being with us today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone stay safe.